This is an episode of Unconfined, a podcast of the Johns Hopkins Center for a Livable Future in Baltimore, Maryland. You can find us online at clf.jhsph.edu. Mike Milley is our sound engineer and produced our theme music. Your hosts are me, Tom Philpot, and Christine Grillo. Paulette Wilson is a producer, and Natalie Wood Wright is the executive producer. The opinions expressed here are not necessarily those of Johns Hopkins University or of the Center for a Livable Future. This episode of Unconfined is part of a series that is exploring worker justice as it relates to factory scale animal farming. I'll kick this off by saying that some of the invisible hands that are essential to our US food systems are the people who work with livestock in factory like farms. Also called CAFOs, which is an acronym for Concentrated Animal Feeding Operations, these so-called farms might house up to a thousand cows or 25 hogs. Actually, that's the minimum that they'll house. And today I'll be talking with Christina Cook, a North Carolina-based journalist and editor for Civil Eats, who's doing amazing coverage of these workers and the dangers that they face in their jobs. Hi, Christina. Hi, great to be here. Thanks so much for being here. Um, Christina, maybe we could start off um, by having you help our audience understand what is so dangerous about these jobs. I think people here working with cows, working with pigs, where's the danger? What are some of the examples of ways that workers get hurt while they're working in CAFOs? Well, um, so agriculture ranks um, third of all industries for fatalities, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Um, And so working with animals is very dangerous because like cows and hogs are very large animals and these workers are tasked with moving them around and um, and just caring for them. So. According to the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, which tracks severe injuries and fatalities, um, there have been 13 um, deaths uh, of workers being asphyxiated or drowning in the manure pits of these animals. So that's since 2003. Um, people are also, you know, gored and trampled and crushed by the animals um, as they're moving them around. There's a lot of heavy machinery in the work. Um, like tractors, et cetera. Um, workers have been entangled in rotating equipment and either lost limbs or their lives. Um, the grain bins are particularly dangerous. Wor- workers asphyxiating in the grain bins that store the food for these animals. Um, and then just accidentally um, stabbing themselves with a vaccine meant for an animal or drinking um, unmarked um, fluids that are actually like cleaning fluids or agents that cause them cause hospitalization. So there's any number of, of injuries that these, these workers are suffering. Wow. Um, I'm wondering if we can pause for a minute on the asphyxiation in grain bins. So mm-hmm. that is a thing that happens. <laughs> yes. That's yes. incredible. And then also in manure pits, can you describe that, that death again? Sure. I mean, there have been a, a number of deaths where, you know, workers often have to get in there to, to unclog things and they lower themselves in. And these these lagoons, which store the manure of the, the hogs or the cows are, you know, the, the gases off of those alone can asphyxiate you before you drown. And that's happened to a number of people like workers will descend into these to try to fix some piece of equipment and then they'll be overcome and unconscious people will go in to try to rescue them and then they die so it's it's a pretty horrific um situation wow yeah and i don't think those are the kinds of deaths that people would imagine happening (laughs) with with livestock and i noticed you hesitated on the word lagoon which i think is appropriate (laughs) because that word sounds really pleasant (laughs) It does. It's the word that that are used to describe these things, but they're just like manure pits. Yeah. Um, (laughs) Okay. so let's talk about who these people are. Um, I think, you know, as I said, they're pretty invisible to most of us who 
buy and eat the food that they produce. Um, who are they? Where are they from? Where do they live? What do they live in? Are they unionized? What's the pay like? Sure. Yeah. So these workers are, um, you know, more, more than half of them are non-white and from Mexico and Central America. Um, many lack authorization to work legally in the U.S., um, they're paid, they work very long hours, like very long shifts. They're not guaranteed days off, um, at the federal level. Um, and a lot of them, the, the pay averages about $16 an hour, about $34,000 a year, um, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And um, my, my work focused mostly on their working conditions, but I knew, do know that as far as their living conditions, um, there's, you know, an affordable housing crisis in rural America, and that kind of extends to these workers. So there's a shortage of housing. The housing that does exist is very expensive compared to what they are paid. So it's very, the housing tends to be very overcrowded. It can be entire families living in a single room, extended families as well. Um, and often, you know, they're dealing with issues like holes in the wall or the floor or, you know, infestations of insects or rodents or, um, stuff like that. And one worker that I spoke with, um, for this piece was a dairy worker in Vermont. And when he arrived to the country at the beginning, he was given a, a wooden pallet on the floor of the barn to sleep, to sleep in. So, wow. So this is housing, maybe you can clarify for me, is this housing provided by their employers or is this housing that they have to go out and find on their own? It's kind of a mix. There's, um, you know, there's government subsidized housing, um, like a migrant housing center. There's also some employers do provide their um, workers with housing. It might be trailers on the property or a house. Um, and then in some cases they are finding private rentals on their own. And did you say that they have no days off? Like they don't have sick days? Yeah. In a lot of, in a lot of states, they are not guaranteed a, a full day off. Though some states are working to change that and guarantee a day off a week. Wow. Okay. And how many people do you think, um, comprise this workforce? Um, so there are about a million farms specializing in livestock in the United States. And of those, about 235,000 of them empl employ workers. And um, so in all, the workforce is about 700, um, 756,000. And, and the point that you mentioned at the beginning um, about them being invisible, it's that is very true. Like they are working in, um, in rural areas and very isolated areas. And, um, they're often working kind of in these windowless barns. Um, and so unlike, you know, a slaughterhouse where they're shoulder to shoulder and advocates can reach them and help, help advocate for them. Um, these workers are so hidden that it's, it's very hard to to find them and they're just sort of very much invisible. Right. Do we have um, mechanisms, like official mechanisms for learning about them and understanding, you know, how many there are, where they're living, what their conditions are like? Um, so the USDA has a few agencies that collect information, like the Economic Research Center Service, excuse me, collects demographics about the uh, farm worker workforce. Um, the National Agricultural Statistics Service collects information about kind of like the farms overall. Um, but, you know, they, there's a National Agricultural Worker Survey um, that's collected and that, that exempts, it, it does not survey livestock workers, that's only crop workers. So there's, there's some information we can know, but it's a little bit limited. Okay. But you feel like that number 756,000 is probably representative? Um, it's the best number that we could get. <laughs> so I don't, there are, there are likely more than that. Um, but that's the official count. Okay. 
Um, you mentioned a little bit earlier um, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, which is a federal agency. It's known as OSHA. Probably most people know the word OSHA. Um, it was created in 1970 to oversee worker safety. And as you just mentioned earlier, agriculture ranks third for dangerous operations with fatal injuries, um, following behind construction and people who work in transportation and warehousing. And OSHA has hundreds of protections for people who work in construction and also for people who do warehousing and transport. But it sounds like there's a real paucity for people who work in agriculture in terms of protections. What can you say about that? Yes. So, um, yes, as the, whereas there are hundreds of standards for workers in other industries, there's a tiny handful of, um, of standards for people who work in agriculture. Um, and, you know, um, so, you know, also, um, the, there's this, uh, a loophole, um, that was established in 1976 that, um, exempts small farms from the, um, from o OSHA oversight. And this was originally introduced as a way to protect small farmers from what was seen as onerous government oversight. Um, but it, um, it has, like as as farms have changed since its establishment and become much more consolidated, had m many more animals, much more automated. Um, this rider has passed every year since 1976, which means that a huge number of workers in agriculture um, do not have that oversight from the government. Um, okay, so maybe let, let's take this step by step for a minute. So a small farm is... How many people or is it 10 people or fewer? Is that the official? Yeah, a small farm is defined as having 10 or fewer non-family employees. Okay, and so this exemption, which we're calling a loophole, this exemption is meant to protect small farms who don't employ a lot of people from unnecessary government oversight. But now because farms are so much more automated, we're finding farms that are actually quite large in terms of the number of animals, but still employ just a few people. Right. Yeah. Because of automation, you know, farms are able to have sometimes thousands of animals with 10 or fewer workers. Right. Um, and so, yeah, we found that the number of farms with 10 or fewer workers um, is nine, 96%. So 96% of farms qualify small, small farms and are not under OSHA's jurisdiction. Okay. That is really a pretty staggering <laughs> statistic. 90% of all farms that have livestock are considered small farms officially. And so they qualify to be exempt from this oversight. Right. Yes. That's quite a loophole. Um, and so when, when we're saying 96% of farms that have animals, some of these farms have like 2,500 pigs and fewer than 10 people working on them. Right. Yes. And um, corporations, you know, farms are able to take advantage of this, um, this exemption because, you know, a lot of times you know, Tyson may own a number of, of farms within a region, but they contract because they're vertically integrated. They contract with independent farmers who then hire workers. So then while the larger company may employ um, more than 10 workers in a region, um, all the individual farms are able to be exempt because of this, um, this exemption okay. from oversight. Wow, that's okay. So that's a pretty important point. So Tyson could be employing dozens of people in a region, but because each, because it, it's parceled out as contract. Right. Each farm that has fewer than 10. So what does it mean for someone who owns one of these farms and has fewer than 10 people working on them? It mean, and, and what does it mean for the workers on them that they are exempt from oversight? Yeah. So when 
a farm, like for a farm that has 10 or more workers, so a, a very large operation and is under OSHA oversight, they will, um, you know, there's a handful of standards that they have to follow. So those are guaranteed like tractors, you know, have to, that are operated by employees have to have like the, it's called the rollover protective structure on top. There's certain chemical handling procedures that have to be followed. Um, so far, large farms do have to follow that. Um, OSHA does on-site cons- consultation programs for farms under its jurisdiction. So they'll go and help help the farms learn how to um, meet the health and safety standards. Additionally, if um, a worker identifies an unsafe condition on their farm, um, they can report that, file a complaint. Um, and if a worker is severely injured, the farm is required to report that within 24 hours. If if a worker dies, the farmers are required to report that within eight hours. So there is um, and then and then farms OSHA will come on if they deem it's necessary to do an investigation. They will investigate the injury or the fatality and then issue penalties for any sort of violation, require the farm to abate that. So to to address the problem and assign penalties. So that's how it works on large farms, farms with more than 10. Okay. And does that as part of the protections for people on large farms, does that come with, um, you know, translators for people who work on the farms or is it mostly about the safety? Um, I think I, I'm not exactly sure about the requirements to have, um, information in both English and, and languages, but, um, yeah, but for, for smaller farms <laughs> that don't have OSHA protection. So this would be 96% of the farms that hire workers. Um, you know, the, the workers just, there's no government oversight. So a worker might, um, get severely injured, might die on the job and no, the government never investigates. No report has to be filed because they're completely exempt. Um, And we found also in our investigation that because of this, um, 85% of the deaths that happened related to animal agriculture in the decade between 20, I think it was 2011 and 2020, 85% of the deaths were not investigated by the federal agency. Um, okay. So, yeah. so the owner of the farm has to report the death somehow, but not to OSHA. Is that right? My understanding is that they don't necessarily have to report the death. Okay. Wow. And so, and then the, the colleagues of the person who's died could try to file a report to OSHA, but they, they really can't because the farm is too small. They, they cannot. Yeah. Um, so I, uh, one of the workers that I interviewed who was kind of at the center of the first piece of the investigation, his name was Lazaro. Um, he was employed by a dairy in New York. He immigrated to the United States in 2013 when he was 55 and within four months of getting a job at a dairy, he, um, it was a small dairy. So it was only him and one other employee. He was taking the cows into the milking parlor in the morning and was just slammed by a bull that he hadn't known was on the property. And he was knocked over. His face hit the um, the metal rail that separates cow beds and he couldn't see out of his eye. He was bleeding profusely. He he had turned out cracked two ribs and lost two teeth in this. And the farmer kind of was there and pulled pulled the bull off told Lazaro to sit by the milking um, shed while the farmer milked all 80 cows (laughs) and then, and then took, had his wife drive Lazaro to the hospital um, where he was told he was lucky to have his vision still and got medical treatment. But then later in um, he was fired two weeks later for being too injured to work. And um, in trying to pursue help, he contacted the Worker Central Center of Central New York, who an advocate tried to um, to contact OSHA and say, could you investigate this? And OSHA said, no, we're, we cannot set foot on this farm because it is it's we're not allowed to we're not allowed to because of this exemption. And so in pursuing workers compensation, you know, it was Lazaro's word versus the farmer and Lazaro, um, you know, for all sorts of reasons is. Um, 
pretty vulnerable in this situation. Um, and the, the farmer tried to say, you know, he wasn't my employee. He was a contract worker. Like no one saw the incident happen. Um, right. Right. I, re I remember reading about him in your article and I, I sort of recall that the doctors were surprised that he had had this injury for so long and it had taken him so long to come in to the hospital. Right. Yeah, he'd sat bleeding for a number of hours before he was able to get to the hospital. Right. That's amazing. Do you have any idea what what Lazaro is doing now? Any follow up on him? Yes, he is still working in dairy. He's still working mm -hmm. in the dairy industry in New York. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, you know, there was one thing I noticed in some of your articles that um, about this loophole that there's a labor camp exception. Is that something worth digging into? So it's not something that that I dug into, but I know that you know, the, the exception, like if there is a temporary labor camp, um, on a small farm, OSHA technically has jurisdiction. Um, what, what qualifies as a labor camp? So my understanding is just basically employer provided housing. So it could be, it could be a rental in town that the employer is paying for. It could be like a trailer on the farm. Um, would qualify as a temporary labor camp. And I know that um, ProPublica has recently did an investigation, I think in the, the past couple of weeks, they published it of um, of this temporary labor camp exemption in on dairy farms is in Wisconsin and found that OSHA is inconsistent in um, in doing investigations on camp on on farms with temporary labor camps. Which is, you know, I did encounter this anecdotally in my own reporting because Lazaro was in a house provided by his employer. Um, it wasn't on the farm, but it was five minutes down the road. Um, and I, you know, I tried asking them, like, was this a temporary labor camp? Should it, should it have been investigated? And without any documentation or any case number, because it was not recorded at the time, um, they, they would not answer that that question. So that's interesting. So the, the temporary labor camp is like an exemption to the exemption. So right. <laughs> the exemption doesn't stand if you have a temporary labor camp, but just based on what we were talking about earlier, it sounds like quite a few of these um, farms have people staying on them, like you said, in trailers and on a pallet, which sounds to me like a temporary labor camp. It sounds very temporary. Hopefully, hopefully yeah. it's temporary. Yeah, <laughs> but that's really hard. It sounds like it's really hard to um, document and prove in a way that gets attention. Right. And it feels like the agency isn't fully tuned into that um, right. based on. Right. What is your sense of um, how OSHA is I'm assuming OSHA's heard a lot about this loophole and what is your sense of how they're responding to it? Well, um, when I asked them about it, um, they just kind of acknowledge, yes, there's this loophole. There's this whole number of farms that we don't have jurisdiction on over and we do care about the safety of workers on the farms and do whatever we can within our you know, within what's allowed to provide for the safety of these workers. Um, but the reality is uh, they just don't have jurisdiction on these farms. And so there's only so much they can do. Yeah. And so what would be the necessary steps to give them some jurisdiction over this? What needs to happen? Well, the so Congress um, is the one that authorizes it. So the loophole is basically put in place. Um, it's saying that you are the your OSHA is not allowed to spend federal money on um, investigating small farms. And so so it's kind of a budget matter. And so it's passed with the appropriations um, bill. And so what would need to happen is um, that language um, would need to be removed from OSHA's budget saying limiting the use of federal dollars. Um, and so it's there have been efforts in the last few years um, 
in 2020, 21, 20, 21 and 22, um, representative Rosa DeLauro, she's a Democrat out of Connecticut has, um, tried to remove the rider from the budget. And this is the first time that anyone's tried to remove it like fully since it was established in 1976. Others have taken little stabs at it to try to write exempt children, you know, stuff like that. But, um, so she successfully, um, got the house to pass a, uh, a budget that did not have the rider in it and would have allowed OSHA full jurisdiction over all farms. But in negotiations with the Senate, um, the rider got added back in. And I, you know, in, Reporting on it this year, um, after our main investigation went out, you know, um, you know, the it's it's back in the language <laughs> um, for the House and the Senate. And President Biden also included it on the first page of his budget for OSHA um, in the budget that he recommended to Congress back in the spring. Wow. OK, um, so this rider was established in 1976. It went uh, 45 years without anyone challenging it until Rosa DeLara did. Yes. I mean, fully challenging it. There have been, in 1999, Senator Jack Reed um, attempted to, you know, say, if if the fatality or the injury involved children, um, then we should allow OSHA to investigate. Um, and then in 20, I think 12, um, the Obama administration tried to pass child labor, um, regulations on farms, um, even exempting, uh, you know, the children of farmers to allow them to continue working on farms, but just exempting hired children, basically. And in both of those cases, the agricultural lobby has, um, rallied people against these additional protections saying that it will destroy family farms, family farms with this additional regulation won't be able to function. It's the end of like, you know, the small family farm, but in fact, you know, small family farms are few and far between. It's, it's corporate now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you need to put small family farms in quotes because when you right. have a thousand cows, that's not a small family farm. Right. Um, okay. So this is this is OSHA appropriations and not part of the farm bill. And so this just goes through appropriations negotiations. Um, so who is advocating for these workers? Like what kind of I, I'm assuming there are a lot of grassroots organizations working on behalf of them. Who are yeah. some of the big players there? Um, well, so farm worker justice is big advocating for farm workers across the United States. Um, and they, their focus is a lot on kind of the crop workers. It, um, I had a hard time finding groups that were advocating for livestock workers specifically. Um, and so t two organizations that I found that had a, a livestock worker focus were, um, we're the Worker Center of Central New York um, that pushes for um, legal representation and community empowerment and advocacy for for ag for livestock workers, especially in the dairy industry. Um, also, Migrant Justice in Vermont has done a lot. They established the Milk with Dignity program, which is kind of seen as a a model solution. Um, they um, you know, they have gotten Ben and Jerry's to sign on to this, um, to this effort. And so all the milk produced in the Ben and Jerry's Northeast supply chain is, um, produced through the milk with dignity program, which is, you know, workers came up with a bunch of, of standards that they felt would ensure their health and safety, their guaranteed minimum wage time off, um, there are safety standards. So like for operating heavy machinery and handling needles and things to prevent repetitive stress and musculoskeletal disorders and just all sorts of things that workers said, this is what we would need to feel safe. The farms have bought in and signed the contract. And then there's an independent standards council that kind of monitors and makes sure that the farms are living up to what they say they're doing. 
Um, and, and the farms are also paid a premium for the milk as, as a result of, um, of this. Right. So upstate New York and Vermont, it's mostly the dairy industry is what it sounds like. Yeah. Yes. Milk with dignity. Okay. And um, are there people in um, elected officials or appointed officials, people other than people who are championing this, like Rose, you mentioned Rosa DeLauro, are there other officials that we might recognize or not recognize who are trying? Um, there, there are, but, um, you know, with the rider specifically, um, not, not many <laughs> other than Delaro. I mean, I, I contacted, um, a number of lawmakers, um, about their thoughts on the rider, given what we know, um, and did not No Republicans responded. And then I, I contacted about a dozen Democrats, including many who are often pretty sympathetic to labor issues like Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders, Cory Booker, and did not receive response um, related to the rider. And I think just there's a lot on the table now. Um, a lot of priorities that people have, like, you know, reducing child labor, like fighting against states, reducing child labor protections, you know, that people are focused on different issues at this point. Right. So this isn't as hot a topic as some of the other ones. This isn't quite the big fire that people are trying to put out at the moment. Right. Okay. Um, and is there something about is, is there something about the fact that it's a rider that makes it more or less difficult to address? I I am not sure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I maybe I need to go back to how a bill becomes a law and all of that. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, in talking with people about the just the process of this rider getting attached, you know, um, it's just there are so many different, so many different bargaining things happening all at once. The rider is kind of in the same process as like, you know, like issues for like abortion issues and all these other things that, um, you know, people are very, I mean, rightly so people are very concerned about. And so it's just the one, um, that gets, you know, has been pushed through. Right. Um, and so who are the big opponents? Who are the people who, um, you know, in the, you mentioned it went, something went through the House and then got blocked in the Senate. What, what's the, what, what's the politics behind people who don't want to remove the rider? So basically the agriculture lobby is, um, opposes, you know, a lot of any measure that is meant to increase regulation or increase protection, whether that's environmental or whether that's labor. Um, and so, you know, each animal has its dedicated trade association, like the, um, you know, the National Chicken Council, National Pork Producers Council, the American Farm Bureau is a big one. Um, and then the individual companies like Tyson, Smithfield, JBS, um, they are, they also have, have lobbyists. Um, and so, the, the individual companies, because they are so consolidated and because, you know, each industry, you know, four, only four companies control the majority of the market share in each individual meat industry. Um, 85% of the beef market is controlled by the same four companies. Right. So these, these what companies are those four have, companies again, that's Cargill, um, J. The, JBS. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm forgetting. We, the exact we can look form, that up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but um, because they are so consolidated, they have very deep pockets to spend on lobbying. And, you know, Tyson alone spent two million um, in 2021 on lobbying at the federal level. Um, two million this, in 2021. Right. Yeah. And a lot of the lobbying is just sort of pushing against um regulation. Um, right. Okay. And yeah, and it's, I'm glad you mentioned the American Farm Bureau, because I think, again, it's one of those things that before I started working in food systems, I would have assumed something like the American Farm Bureau was a perfectly benign organization, because it sounds good. But, um, 
yeah, it, it turns out to lobby against a lot of these measures that could really help people's lives be improved. Um, right. Um, so given all of this um, danger that these people face in their jobs to get us our food, what is something that we can do that someone listening to this podcast could do to advocate for people who need more protection? Well, I think um, because so much of this work or so many these workers and their issues are so under the radar, I think um, a good first step would be just to educate yourself about um, the workforce supplying our meat supply. Um, I imagine this podcast <laughs> would be a good source of information. Um, Civil Eats also reports very, very regularly on farm worker issues and labor issues. Um, so educating yourself is a, would be a great first step. And then, and then people that I spoke with just said applying pressure to representatives, the lawmakers who are passing the budgets um, right. well, and what, making like, the laws. What is the language that, like, if I were going to call up my senator or my representative, what would I say on the phone? Um, so you might mention the fact that the um, there's a small, you're aware of the small farm rider that exempts um, 96% of farms in the United States in the United States from um, OSHA oversight and that the workers on these farms have no one to um, to report unsafe conditions to, no one to follow up if they're injured or hurt, and that you would like the loophole to be closed and for, for these farms to come under um, OSHA oversight. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And, and I, I, I am, I mean, we talked about this a little bit, but you did say that your sense is that OSHA feels like they would like this to happen too. OSHA would like to be able to oversee. Uh, they did not say that in that, <laughs> okay. this, those many words, but uh -huh. um, I would, I would imagine that an agency would want, you know, full power to, um, to be able to do the job that they do. Right. Right. And they they cannot. The official language is that they can't spend money investigating these. They can't spend federal money investigating. And so one thing to point out is that 22 um, states uh, run their own state plan OSHAs. So um, but and, and of those states, 13 of them um, or 12 in, in Puerto Rico do not observe the small farm exemption. And they can, and so the, in 13 states, um, the state is able, does have jurisdiction over small farms. You know, these farms are, I mean, these states um, are not like big livestock states. It, you know, um, they're more like California and, you know, I'm, you know, like I think Kentucky may be one. Um, but um, so they, there are a few places in the, in the country where, um, OSHA, state OSHA has jurisdiction. That's interesting. Okay. Um, okay. So, Christina, what haven't we talked about that you feel like people listening to this might want to know? Is is there something we didn't cover? I'm trying to think. Um, I can't think of anything right now. Okay. I'm just curious because you did mention child labor do you, I, I'm sure this is anecdotal, but do you have any sense of whether people who work with livestock are for the most part adults or do any of them, are any of them children? I, I don't have the numbers on that. I would imagine that they are mostly adults. Um, you, you wouldn't, hopefully wouldn't hire a child to work with. Boys. To like yeah. move a hog. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Well, um, thank you so much for joining us for this episode. Um, again, if you tuned in late, this is Christina Cook. She's um, our guest today coming from North Carolina, where she uh, is a journalist who reports on worker issues with livestock um, for Civil Eats. She's also an editor there. And um, she's just told us a lot about 
things we might want to know about the small farm loophole in terms of how OSHA is able to protect and oversee people who work with livestock, which turns out to be a very dangerous job. So thank you so much for sharing everything from your many hard years of investigation on this. Great. Thank you for your interest. I really appreciate okay. it. All right. Take care. This is an episode of Unconfined, a podcast of the Johns Hopkins Center for a Livable Future in Baltimore, Maryland. You can find us online at clf.jhsph.edu.